I think there are one or two points that we should first of all attempt to clarify, not only in connection with the discussion of this evening, but with the present series in general. This is not intended uh, to convey any disrespect uh, for the ideas of psychic phenomena. We are not attempting to disprove psychic phenomena. What we are attempting to do is to point out uh, personal experiences, particularly in those areas of so-called or actual psychic phenomena, which have a direct bearing upon the psychological integration of the individual. Uh, various types of obsession or spirit possession uh, have been recorded since the very beginning of human experience. Many references to these subjects are to be found in the Bible, and they occur in the sacred writings of many other countries. Possession by demons is part of the oldest legendary and lore of our human race. We also realize that for many thousands of years, all so-called psychic phenomena had to be interpreted in terms of observation only. There was no knowledge uh, as to the more subtle workings of the human uh, psychological entity. There was no way of differentiating between, for instance, a legitimate example of spirit control and hysteria. We know definitely, from going back over the old records, that many mistakes were made in the interpretation of these various mysteries which involve ghosts and diabolism generally. There was no way in which it could be otherwise, because uh, all that could be done was to judge from appearances, from the seemingness of things. And from this seemingness, even today, uh, we suffer uh, considerably, not only in our objective, but in our subjective consciousness. Even at this time, any form of mental disturbance is terrifying to the average person. Something in him goes back to the most primitive atavistic experiences of his race. He does not know how to cope with this type of situation. Very often he has no clear uh, concept of right attitude toward the mentally disturbed. He is afraid of them, or else he takes the position that they are putting it all on, or that they uh, could straighten themselves out if they wanted to, and things of this nature. It's very hard for us to handle this type of ailment even now. It is one of the most difficult and thankless jobs in the world. This brings us definitely to uh, several situations that I think we have to clarify. First of all, the term obsession, as it is now used, has two distinct meanings. Obsession in old times and among metaphys metaphysicians today implies the control of the conscious faculties of a person by the consciousness of some other being. Obsession, therefore, is really an individual whose inner life has been taken over or stolen from him uh, by something else. And this something else or someone else is now using the body of that person. This type of obsession, of course, belongs largely uh, to the older theological concepts. It was believed in 
uh, for thousands of years before any modern psychological uh, theory was available, and various exorcisms to drive out these obsessing or possessing spirits are recorded in all the religious literature of mankind. The second type of meaning for the word obsession is very largely recent. And obsession has come psychologically to mean that the individual is possessed by some fragment of his own total personality. Uh, by obsession is meant an extraordinary fixation of some kind. Therefore, we say that a person is obsessed by an idea, that he is possessed by a notion. We feel that under certain conditions also, certain phases of the personality can become completely possessive, that the individual can be possessed by his own fears, by his own worries, by his own anxieties. And the moment the person loses control of his total personality, and some other part of that personality usurps power, we, incli we are inclined to think of it as obsession. A man, as we realize, is made up of a number of different natures, a number of different fragmentary personalities. Under normal conditions, these are all subservient uh, to the dominant psychic mood. They are dominant uh, only uh, perhaps in dreams or in sleep, but in consciousness, the fragments are under the control of a leader. And this leader is the normal self-consciousness of the person. While this leadership is maintained, uh, any effort uh, to break the natural harmony of such organization is observed as a dangerous symptom. The total consciousness, therefore, rejects minor aberrations. It refuses to grant uh, to certain phases of its own nature the power to control the rest. Thus, for example, an individual who has an inordinate attitude toward alcohol, who likes to drink too much, if he has a controlling consciousness, this consciousness tells him to get sober and stay sober, and he does. As long as this consciousness is ruling, all of these pressures that are within the personality are held in check. It is like a strong government. While government is strong, crime, and all these other antisocial factors are very largely controlled. If government becomes weak or corrupted, uh, then we find immediately a lowering of the general condition of the community. Now, one thing that is always noticeable uh, where weakness afflicts the central area of consciousness that as a result, there is always a lowering. Uh, the threshold drops. Uh, the individual who ceases to exercise his own consciousness is not benefited in any way uh, by this loss of central control. It is very difficult to imagine a great nation that would be better if it had no laws. Actually, there are a few people to whom perhaps the absence of law would have very little effect upon living. But for the overwhelming majority, the moment uh, legal defense was lowered, crime would increase. Now, it is the same in the case of the individual lowering the defenses of his own consciousness. He is never the better if the central conscious core loses control. Whatever fragments take over are always less than the total picture. Therefore, we find almost no indication that possession or obsession or control of any kind, whether considered psychically or psychologically, 
that such control contributes a great deal to the improvement of the person. Usually something is weakened. And this is all the more true in the case of psychological uh, control. Now, the old religions of the world have pointed out that there have been legitimate instances in which a comparatively humble person has been overshadowed by a great spiritual being. That for one reason or another, the individual has come to be possessed by a sacred or holy spirit. That a holy spirit has descended upon them as the mysterious spirit that descended upon the apostles at Pentecost. Obviously, we would not expect a divine spirit descending upon an individual to hurt them, to corrupt them, or to lead them away from the paths of righteousness and right conduct. Thus, from even the time of Aquinas and Albertus Magnus in the Middle Ages, it was customary to divide spirits into constructive and destructive. And uh, perhaps we can formulate very, a very simple rule. If a person is controlled by a higher part of his own nature than normally controls him, we may then say that he has an extension of consciousness that he has a mystical experience, that his consciousness becomes more illumined, more enlightened. And out of the consequences of this illumination, he is dedicated to a holy life. Or at least he is dedicated to some course of action superior to his condition prior to this enlightenment. Thus we can say that the um, mystical enlightenment of Jesus or the enlightenment of Buddha represented consciousness unfolding into a greater dimension. It is quite evident that uh, from such a positive consciousness, and the Neoplatonists have given us considerable material bearing on this, that the individual is improved. Thus we have to assume that an individual who has a legitimate spiritual experience is not injured thereby. By converse uh, circumstance, an individual who is injured by any kind of a metaphysical experience cannot regard this experience as constructive. If he is injured, then the circumstance is not good. If he is improved, then perhaps the circumstance is good. But he has to be very careful in measuring the degrees and conditions of his improvement. Improvement is not measured in a sense of self-satisfaction. Improvement is not a self-delusion due to a psychosis of some nature. The individual is not simply filled with wonderfulness and then slowly collapses. This sense of superiority, of the attainment of a greater or higher level, must always be measured in terms of a better adjusted life, that the person has a larger area of constructive, real living. He is not gradually disappearing into a phantom inhabited realm. He does not vanish into a mysterious cloud of celestials. Uh, the truly enlightened person becomes a more useful, a more reasonable, a better self-disciplined, better integrated individual with better attitudes toward every situation that can arise in life. Therefore, we have no argument whatever with any situation which causes the person to grow. If it happens that he is perfectly convinced that this growth is due to possession by a superior entity, that is his business. 
if he regards it as the result of a deeper internal integration with his own consciousness, this is also according to his own conviction, and he should follow his conviction. The problem is a very simple one. By their works, so shall ye know them. But if in any uh, problem of this nature that arises, we observe that the experiences are attended by deterioration, then we must question very greatly not only the nature of the experience, but the uh, advisability of the continuance of any circumstance contributing to it. For instance, we have all kinds of funny things that happen. Uh, people who will come in and they'll say to me, I had the most wonderful spiritual experience a few nights ago. Uh, will you explain it for me? Now, they're perfectly certain that if they tell me the story, I can explain it for them. And yet there's something strange about a spiritual experience which in no way helps the individual to explain it himself. Here is something that is, to him, a proof of enlargement of consciousness. But the enlargement of consciousness doesn't tell him anything about the meaning of what has happened to him. So we must check this one aside as being at least, shall we say, doubtful. There is something unrealistic about it. The individual who becomes more and more spiritual without any increase in wisdom or insight, uh, it, it's, a, it's a little dangerous situation. It's something that we have to think about very carefully. Now, in the beginning, these situations perhaps are extremely borderline. But I'm reaching the place in life now where I have followed these various situations over periods of years. I have been able to see them work out in hundreds of cases. Therefore, perhaps uh, I have a little better license to guess on these things than some other individuals who have had very limited or no experience. But this we say uh, empirically. Uh, that the ancient divided all such psychic manifestations as spirit control, obsession, or possession uh, into two grand classifications, one of which was possession by good spirits and the other by bad spirits. Good spirits worked good. Bad spirits worked evil. And we have to find out if we can what is meant by the fact uh, that bad spirits do work evil? The first thing that you observe uh, in most cases is that the individual coming under an obsessional or possessional condition begins to lower his threshold. This is one of the most common symptoms that we have. The only answer immediately is that whatever it is, the situation is bad. This person is less a person than he was before. He may not do what I have seen some do, get down on the grass in front of his house and bark like a dog. But he may find that under the influence of these spirits, certain things happen. And here is a typical case, so typical that it could be multiplied to infinity. The individual has an experience which he cannot explain entirely. This experience has arisen from any one of several causes. Nearly always there is a reasonably obvious cause. And one of the most common is that he has attempted to develop spiritual faculties in some way. He has joined some organization, he has read some book, he has done something whereby he wanted to develop some spiritual overtones in his nature. Uh, sometimes if you ask him why he wanted to, the cat is out of the bag. Because you will find in most cases that his motives 
while good in the common sense of the word, were not good on the level of the thing he was trying to do. He might say, well, uh, I've always been extremely shy, I've never adjusted well socially, I wanted to develop strength of personality. Well, uh, we have courses on the subject. No one would regard this as especially bad, but I think that uh, an individual who is having these kind of personality deficiencies should go somewhere where they can teach him to make friends and influence people. I don't think he should use religious means to achieve this end. I think he should just uh, take any one of the number of courses for increasing charm that are available and leave the matter in the material world where it belongs. Another individual who is lonely or neurotic or has had a broken home, is unadjusted, uh, reaches out into these mysterious zones for almost any one of a number of complicated motives. Most of these motives are not essentially the correct one. This individual does not want to become wiser simply that he may live better in the sense of his spiritual values. He does not want to become wiser for the one and total reason that he wants to dedicate his life to the service of other people. This is not his kind of motive. He wants perhaps to be wiser, maybe he'd like to do a little good, but maybe he is trying to build a status symbol in himself. There are all kinds of motives, but nearly everyone who gets into these troubles has tried to use some religious or mystical means of unfolding his internal life. He may have gotten into bad company when he started. He may have been totally unfit for the per se procedure. He may have created a situation within his own nature uh, which was not at all reasonable or practical. But in the beginning, whatever it was, he seemed to enter into a very beautiful summer land. A, a summer land of a warm, rosy sense of personal superiority. He, uh, he really is getting somewhere. His spiritual ambitions were beginning to make him think in terms of divinity being just around the corner. He may have uh, uh, any one of a whole variety of minor psychic phenomena. He may get the irresistible impulse to write poetry. He may develop um, automatic writing. He may hear voices, and these voices tell him how wonderful everything is and how very wonderful he is. Then gradually, uh, the situation unfolds a little more. He has visions and dreams. He wanders around and picks up a couple of dozen initiations along the way. <laughs> By this time, he is on his way to spiritual aristocracy. Things are getting more important, more wonderful every moment, and he has also accumulated the manuscripts of at least three books on uh, spiritual values that are going to change the course of human destiny. This goes on for a while. Sometimes it goes on for a year, sometimes for several years. And then something begins to go bad. Little by little, these internal experiences uh, lose their, lose something of their beauty. Uh, they begin to lose something of their purity. The individual slowly begins to sense that there is an evil presence somewhere in this. He begins to suspect very strongly that he is being taken over by some kind of a destructive force. Uh, the marvelous ecstatic symptoms of mysticism that he experienced, uh, have ex has experienced, now begin to be rather creeping, fearful things associated almost with the fears and frights of a person in a haunted house. Little by little, uh, these spiritual forces around him uh, turn into demons. Uh, they plague him. They won't let him sleep. They cause all kinds of strange sensations in his body. Uh, they attacked his emotional structure. 
they increase his animal instincts profoundly. Little by little, he becomes frightened to death. Of some kind of a Pandora's box, he is opened and cannot close again. And instead of uh, going on to greater and greater bliss, he gradually sinks into a terror that not only can destroy his happiness, but may very well ultimately destroy his reason. Now, this pattern is so familiar, so constant, uh, that it is very difficult not to cons give it some consideration. In the early stages of the problem, when everything is beautiful, you can't tell the person that he is headed into trouble. After he gets a little way into trouble, you can't tell him it's his own fault. He won't believe you anymore. And when he is in really deep trouble, you can't do anything for him because he will not accept any reasonable attitude toward his situation. All he wants you to do is to tell him how terribly somebody else is injuring him. Now, in this procedure also, the individual, gradually sensing a rising tide of evil around him, who uh, begins to sense these negative forces creeping in, whose sleep is disturbed, who has this sense of the presence of hatred and hateful things, begins to try to explain it. Who is trying to hurt him? Well, at this stage of the game, he can hit on almost anyone. Uh, sometimes these people turn on their very nearest and dearest friends, accusing them of every kind of psychic malpractice. Uh, sometimes they turn upon religious leaders, whom they regard as being responsible for their condition. Uh, very often they turn upon any individual uh, who has a mysterious look or who uh, has perhaps uh, in some way seemed to be distantly related to the situation. Uh, from that time on, this strange injury becomes a problem of psychic malpractice. The individual suffering from the situation can only think of so one answer. Something, someone is attempting to destroy him. And as it goes on and on and on, he gains greater fear of this destroying thing. And because of its gradual inroad upon his own consciousness and integration, uh, he loses by degrees any power to resist it. He loses any way to solve this problem. And if by some chance he might be the victim of some person who is sending evil thoughts to him, he is sure that these evil thoughts are arriving. In most cases that I have known, people who are supposed to send evil thoughts haven't got enough energy in them to send anything, and no skill with which to direct anything they did send. But to someone who is being hurt, each of these other weaklings, these persons who have no real knowledge of anything, take on the appearance of Spangali's. Each one is, uh, is endowed or imbued with tremendous black and evil forces. Before it's over, the person is simply fighting back in the ghost world of Central Africa or something of that nature. He's back in the, in the, in the jungle, in the jungle of the witch doctor and the juju man, a, a jungle of Bhutan, as it is called in the West Indies, a jungle, a jungle of sorcery and witchcraft that seems strangely and mysteriously out of place in the 20th century world in which we live. But to those who suffer, this is nothing funny. Their own problem is an extremely serious and difficult one. And they are gradually bringing themselves into a situation of mind and emotion in which they are going to fight desperately against help. And as it becomes more and more obvious, uh, the situation that they are in, they become more and more like the truly mentally sick who will accuse everyone who tries to help them of wanting to hurt them more. It is, it is a very discouraging, confusing, difficult situation. It is because of this type of thing which I have seen repeated so frequently 
that I am slow to advise anyone to lift this lid of the Pandora's box. Uh, there seems to be very little that can come out of the box that is worth the danger associated with it. Uh, individuals who have dabbled with these subjects have become founders of organizations and leaders of movements, and they have developed followings, and their followings are getting into trouble all the time. No one seems to know what the real facts are. Everyone is sure that they are living in a world of vampires and warlocks. Uh, they believe definitely uh, in weir wolves and weir bats. And uh, there is nothing in the legends of Dracula that they have not experienced in some way. Now, this isn't really a very happy state of affairs. It seems so uh, desperately unnecessary. It would seem as though uh, something within the individual should pick him out of this dilemma at an early date. Why he, he does not pick himself out of it, uh, perhaps is best understood when we analyze problems involving alcoholism and narcotic addiction. There comes a time in both of these uh, when dependency upon an abnormal situation become so great that the individual no longer even struggles to restore normalcy. Also, if you have had many years of this type of situation, it is very hard to face it. It is hard to face the fact that you have deceived yourself or you have been deceived by others for perhaps the best part of a lifetime. Uh, people cannot face these emergencies. And uh, especially when the entire emotional nature has already been seriously damaged uh, by attitudes that were not right or not constructive. I doubt very much if psychology as we know it today can do very much uh, for what might be termed advanced cases of this difficulty. Once the individual reaches a, an advanced stage, he fights all help because the only thing he wants to prove is that he is right. He does not want to get well. He wants to prove that he is suffering because he has been terribly hurt, injured, or afflicted. It is far more important for him to uh, be able to prove the presence of a demon than it is to get rid of the demon. It's hard to believe this, but there are so many people who just have to be right. And they would rather die than admit that they are not right. And in this area, if you will not admit that you are not right, you're very apt to die. And so in time, these cases disappear and others take their place, but the old mystery goes on. And while the area is comparatively limited, the difficulties within it uh, can be extremely uh, terrifying to those who are picked up in some such a situation. The only answers that we know or have for these problems are rather simple, and yet in many instances they are adequate. The first, prob the first problem you have to find is some way of convincing the person in trouble that a trained outsider who knows this field and knows the situations thoroughly is more likely to be right than they are. Now, this is hard to do. One way upon which some have succeeded was by charging $50, an interview. Somehow we feel an individual must be terribly right if we have to pay him $50. We listen to him then. Even we don't agree with him, we listen to him because it's costing us money. Well, this is one way in which sometimes you can create an attitude of respect. It isn't the best, but it's sometimes the only one there is. You cannot help these people unless you can, uh, in some way, convince them that you know more about their problem than they do. Most of them will declare that this is impossible because they are living with the problem. 
Yet in many areas we know that there are patterns and plans of things which can be grasped or understood better by an outsider than a person who is involved in the situation. This is sometimes true of marriage counseling, where a third person can be very much more effective than the two who are deeply involved, either romantically or in controversy. It is also true that the average physician uh, can give us some help in matters of dyspepsia, when perhaps uh, we would not be able to correct the condition alone. From experience we gain certain knowledge, and from this knowledge we can help if the individual is willing to accept the help. He is most likely to, to accept it almost in any area where there has not been some form of psychic interference. But where the psychic nature is disturbed, uh, the individual is very slow and reluctant to accept help unless it is what he expects and wants. You must agree with him first. And of course, if you agree with him first, you can do him no good. And if you agree with him first long enough and hard enough, you will join him in the difficulty. If you believe what he believes, you will soon be as sick as he is. So there's no answer in this area. So somewhere along the way, any individual who is in these kind of troubles has got to take the answer or take the attitude that he has to have help and that regardless of whether he agrees with the help or not, he'd better take it. And he may, of course, refuse it several times and find conditions getting worse and finally be driven to it. But there has to be the realization that the individual cannot be always miserable and always right. He has to find this out himself. Now, when you have a problem of this nature working its way into your classifications, uh, you have several situations that you first think of. To the average person involved in some form of mystical uh, problem, uh, the only question is to distinguish, if possible, the nature of the offending spirit or the possessing entity, or the obsessing demon. To a great many persons, there's no question about these things at all, any more than there was question in the minds of the monks of the 12th century who went out waving wolfbane in front of the noses of presumably, presumably possessed people. It was not a question of any doubt concerning the possession. It was just trying to discover the details in with a little greater clarity than before. I don't feel that we can approach the problem in this way. Uh, we have a very different basic way of life, and our problem is not just to agree with the individual and try to argue some ex uh, obsessing entity into departing. The question we now have to find out is what is really at the bottom of the difficulty. We have to try to study the various possibilities to consider one against another, to weigh one condition against another. We no longer, for example, today believe as the Greeks did that everyone who has epilepsy is inhabited by a god, that a special deity is responsible for epilepsy and that all individuals having it are by that factor alone uh, divine beings. We question that very strongly today. And I think from experience of thousands of years, we have a right to question it. And we have a right to question a great many other things that were once generally believed. So a person comes to us discussing or describing symptoms which might arise from 50 different causes. As far as he is concerned, they can only arise from one cause, the cause that he has attributed to them. But if we uh, go no further than to pat him on the back and say, that's right, that's right, we are not helping him any, 
Because if he is right, he is in worse trouble than he probably thought he was. So we have to try to find out what causes strange and mysterious feelings within a person. What causes him to have the belief or feeling that mysterious creatures are crawling on him at night, presuming, of course, that he's sober? But what, uh, <laughs> what, uh, what would cause him to have such feelings? Well, why would he believe that something is blowing its breath in his ears, or whispering to him, or making his hair stand on end, or sending cold chills up and down his spine, or hot flashes up and down his, the front of him? Uh, what is causing these things? Why do his arms twitch? Why does he sense or feel that the bed is moving? Well, if he has delirium tremens, why we just sort of decide that's it. But uh, most of these people do not have delirium treatments. So they say we hear voices, we see things, we see lights dancing in front of us, we see ghostly shadows standing around, we think or do hear tappings on tables. Uh, our cat looks at us with a very bleary look, <laughs> as though it is seeing a great many things that we cannot see, puts its tail between its legs and runs away. Uh, we uh, have the sense of people being around. We hear voices constantly chattering at us. We smell strange odors all the way from fake fragrancy to the most abominable smells. Uh, the house seems to shake. We've lost all our friends. Uh, the situation is well out of hand. Now, what is the cause of it? Well, we can get uh, advice in a number of ways. But I think the problem that we have to determine very definitely is what are the most likely reasonable explanations? Not what is the most fantastic one. Not what is the one that will permit us to keep all of our previous beliefs and go on having these miseries. But what is it that would help us to find out what is wrong and what can we do about it? So usually when an individual comes in with a situation of this type, we recommend a complete physical checkup. It is so prosaic that they look at us with the deepest sense of, uh, to say, almost repugnance. Uh, they, they didn't believe anyone could be stupid enough to make that suggestion. But it pays off in a great many cases. We find that these symptoms are present in various combinations in a great many physical ailments. Uh, these symptoms also sometimes announce the uh, inroads of sickness. If the symptoms are quickly caught, the individual uh, makes a good recovery. If physical symptoms are mistaken for spiritual symptoms and the individual tries to combat them by mental means year after year, is liable to wake up someday uh, in too advanced a case uh, of physical sickness to hope for a recovery. So let us be very simple about these things and very direct. I have known cases of very complicated metaphysical symptoms that with a literal interpretation could mean almost anything that were finally traced to high blood pressure. And when the blood pressure was corrected, the symptoms ceased. Now, a legitimate uh, spiritual entity does not depart because the blood pressure is normal. Therefore, we have every reason to assume that any treatment that removes the symptoms permanently without addiction to any drug or medication must uh, have come fairly close to the cause. We also find that a great many of these symptoms arise from compound stress pressures. We find that individuals do not always have the same kind of battle fatigue in this world. 
what we used to call a nervous breakdown can arise from any number of different causes. It can arise from any stress that reaches a condition when it becomes unendurable. And each person has a different breaking point. Now, some individuals, when they have a truly nervous breakdown, simply have a general uh, uh, dislocation, we might say, of the uh, sympathetic nervous system. They, they simply become nervously uncoordinated. Uh, they cannot stand strain. They develop symptoms of hysteria. Uh, they uh, are unable to work. They have to have a rest. And they have to allow the nervous system to recuperate. An ordinary, old-fashioned, well uh, developed nervous breakdown, while it isn't an ailment at all, is simply fatigue. It is something that is that has worn us down. <clears throat> now you say to an individual, is there any possibility that your ailment is uh, a fatigue ailment? Uh, are you suffering from nervous exhaustion? The individual say, of course not. Uh, I haven't done anything to cause uh, a nervous exhaustion. And so you press back into the life a little bit and you find three unhappy marriages. That's just as likely to cause nervous exhaustion as a 16-hour day for 10 years under the most heavy mental responsibility. The individual is unhappy. The individual is unadjusted, neurotic, lonely. The individual is hypersensitive, have gradually driven away their friends. Sometimes they are simply antisocial. They can't get along at all in the world in which they live. They have nothing but criticism for every law, every country, and every official in the nation. These criticisms may be in many instances well-founded, but no individual can afford to live with them himself because his constant criticizing attitude will destroy him. So after we get all through, we find that the person has been giving himself some kind of a psychic beating for half a lifetime. And this beating may be fear, it may be worry, it may be self-pity, it may be living with the realization or remembrance of ungrateful children, it may be fear of some physical ailment or infirmity. It may be a tragedy in marriage. It may be a continuing failure in business or ungrateful children or anything you want to have. But the individual who lives in a condition of being continually miserable about something or anything, or who is constantly suffering from self-pity, self-blame, or simple selfishness, which causes him to demand things that are unreasonable or impossible to him. Any person who lives with this long enough can go to pieces. So when we find the individual who has psychic difficulties, we say to this individual, are you a happy, busy, well-adjusted person with a proper circle of friends, interesting activities and avocational interests? Are you naturally cheerful and optimistic? Are you uh, inclined to look forward with hope and friendship and kindness to the future? Do you have a religion that gives you strength and calmness? Are you free from unreasonable fears? And have you your own temperament under reasonable control? Now, it's not once in 10,000 times that that person can honestly answer yes. It might happen, but it'll be very rare. The individual in these difficulties is nearly always a person who is shadowed by some kind of a negative attitude. Now, some people don't develop these attitudes. They're born with them. We have to face this. 
And this perhaps has a bearing upon their problem, because having been born this way, they do not know they are different. I have seen children born into this world, and I have known the children when they were young, and I have now seen these children grow up and go out into business and have their own children. And I'm always very worried when I see a small child who has a certain kind of a gray heaviness on their features. It's a very strange look. It's a look that you can sometimes notice quite clearly on a six-month-old child. It is a kind of, uh, well, broodingness, a kind of sulkingness, a look in which the face and the eyes seem to be strangely shadowed, not by any color that you can really see, but as though the sun was under a cloud when it was shining on them. A kind of strange, heavy look. Nine times out of ten, these children will grow up uh, to be extremely unadjusted people. Uh, they will fight their way through childhood. They will never be happy, no matter what you do for them. They will never be appreciative, no matter what you give them. Uh, they will misinterpret everything that you try to do or say. They will resent punishment even when it is needed. They will escape from discipline by every subterfuge imaginable. And usually, in an effort to get their own way, they develop early in life the habit of the tantrum. The tantrum being this emotional outburst, which is at first a theatrical production on the part of the child simply to discomfort the parent and to get its own way, because the parent just doesn't want to live through this type of thing. And if the child gets away with it a few times, the tantrum becomes the basis of hysteria. And from that time on, in every emergency of life, the individual will slip into an hysterical condition. As time goes on, this hysteria closes in. Wherever we have, therefore, any of these severe temperamental pressures, we have an individual who can gradually uh, create a variety of reactions from within himself which he cannot understand. Hysteria is a mysterious term. Uh, in the, the mid-Victorian period, an individual who was hysterical was usually a young lady who proceeded to faint in somebody's arms. This was about all the world knew about hysteria. Today we know that hysteria is not the same thing as an hysterical spell. The individual who faints gracefully in somebody's arms is in no danger at all, because they've decided where they were going to land before they fell. <laughs> Uh, the problem today is the hysteria that breaks through often a rather strong, perhaps overly disciplined personality. And breaking through may assume a group of different phenomenal aspects. We have hysterical blindness, in which the individual is factually and actually blind, but there is nothing wrong with their eyes. We have an hysterical uh, diabetes in which blood sugar will run very high to a dangerous point and can be fatal, but the individual does not actually have diabetes. We can have hysterical deafness, and people have had it for 20 years. We can have hysterical paralysis in which the individual can be held to a wheelchair for half a lifetime. And occasionally we have these so-called recorded miracles in which a person apparently suffering from some one of these incurable ailments, which cannot be otherwise diagnosed by even the average specialist in the field, has what might be termed a miraculous recovery. He got miraculously got over something he never had. But hysteria gave him all of the symptoms of that ailment. Now, if hysteria can cause you to be palsied for 20 years, 
or can prevent you from being able to get out of a wheelchair for half a lifetime. We realize that hysteria can not only affect the physical body, but the entire psychic integration. The individual under hysteria may have practically any type of delusion. The individual under hysteria can hypnotize himself. And under auto-hypnosis, you can see and hear and talk to things that have been created out of your own mind, just as certainly as under a professional hypnotist, you can assume that the uh, living room rug is a river and take off your shoes and socks and try to wade across it. You can have visual phenomena. And to the average person, that which he sees has to be true. That is part of his philosophy of life. Therefore, when this type of thing takes on some psychical overtone, it never occurs to him to doubt it. You cannot tell him that he didn't see the ghost, because he did see it. And all the effort in the world to try to convince him of the real facts are meaningless, because he is making a basic mistake. He is forgetting the power of his own consciousness to enforce visualization. He is forgetting the fact that by the process of hypnosis, of auto-hypnosis, he can see anything that he demands to see. He can hear anything. He can just as easily perform a ream of automatic writing. He can, by auto-hypnosis, produce any kind of auditory phenomena. He can also hear all kinds of voices, and he can create by this auto-hypnosis a continuing condition in which by restating the hypnosis, just as in ordinary examples, he can continue to perpetuate the same general type of experiences over a lifetime. Now, why should he want to? He doesn't. Auto-hypnosis in this case is nothing but the gradual building up of an attitude until it takes over dominion of the life. The individual is therefore now psychologically obsessed. He is obsessed by a belief. He is obsessed by, by for instance, by a common situation that we hear frequently referred to. The individual says, I've always been unhappy. It seems as though everything I ever tried to do went wrong. This is a good start for an obsession. Because the individual, by continuing to repeat this, will gradually create a condition in which he will reduce the probabilities of anything good happening to him. And will in time, if the condition continues to close around him, uh, create morbid fatalities and tragedies which will take on miraculous or metaphysical implications. He will finally really believe that some evil spirit is persecuting him. So we come back to the original problem. Is the person who is in trouble a really well-integrated person in himself? If he isn't, this is one of his difficulties. The next problem that frequently presents itself is a religious one. What is the religious conviction of the individual who gets into these difficulties? The answer usually has to be one of two. First, that the individual belongs to some religious movement that believes in this, that believes that these demons are going to be possible, and has threatened, perhaps, the sufferer with some penalty for disobedience. And the sufferer, having the sense of guilt within himself, has thereby uh, regarded it necessary for him to accept the punishment. The second type of person most likely to be in trouble is the one religiously bewildered, who has no firm foundation who has no clear concept of religious values and has really no interest in trying to understand the basic philosophies of life upon which a strong, well-oriented 
character can be built. We do not find many good students of philosophy and related matters uh, in this kind of trouble. We find people who have not thought too clearly, and therefore to whom anything may be true. If they have been deeply thoughtful and have put the universe in order under a pattern of laws, they have then immediately asked themselves, what have I done that is wrong when I get into trouble? But where they are not so well interested, uh, integrated, their first question is, who is hurting me when I don't deserve it? So the problem of trying to understand whether we deserve certain experiences or not comes under the philosophical aspect of the problem. But we have these two general areas. The third situation that sometimes has to be taken into very definite consideration is a present continuing adversity by which the individual has reached a point of internal uh, despair. If the individual is living in a factual situation for which there is no apparent remedy, if he is bound to conditions which are hopeless, if he senses or sees no probability of future improvement, if life to him means only the continuance of a situation in which life is not worth living, then this individual begins to seek desperate methods of escape. And this uh, desperate escape mechanism uh, may cause him uh, to develop uh, unreasonable negative fears because his own nature is basically fear-ridden. Now, when we come to the next pattern of, uh, of the situation, we go into other things that might have some effect upon the person's life as a psychic entity. Man is very much the product of his own nutrition, just as surely as his mental life is the result, result so his physical life, which includes the manifestation of his mental and emotional patterns, may very well be heavily influenced by the way it is fed. I think there is no doubt in the world that the unusual increase in various forms of psychic and psychological difficulties can be in part at least attributed uh, to the excessive abuse of medications and a definite failure of right nutritional patterns. If the individual is improperly nourished, he is uncomfortable, and discomfort is the beginning of misery, and misery spreads. The individual who is physically uncomfortable, or is physically without adequate supporting energy, is a natural uh, possibility for psychic depression. If his energies do not maintain him, if he doesn't get up in the morning feeling like facing the day with a good hope, if he has to crawl around hour after hour, half dead, it is very easy for him to fall into negative mental and emotional patterns. And if this goes on long enough and he has recourse to stimulants to get a day's work done, he is on his way to further trouble. Therefore, I have observed that in a great many cases, people suffering from various psychic and psychological disturbances are suffering from malnutrition or from various faulty types of nutrition. We have to realize that in order to maintain the relationship between the mental emotional structure and the physical nervous system, the machinery has to be in reasonable functioning order. If you have a beautiful television set and a bad tube in it, the pattern, the program will never come through distinctly. 
you will have distortion. And these problems that we are concerned with are distortions. They are something that is not coming through correctly. So we must begin to take consideration of these possibilities. There are all kinds of circumstances that can lead to an upset in the biochemical balance of the human body. If this is bad, badly unbalanced, we will have mental and emotional symptoms as inevitable results. One problem that we can have, for example, is through over-medication, that we have unbalanced the natural aptitudes and uh, functions of the organs or the various chemical processes of the body. We can open ourselves to a one kind of sickness while taking medications against another. We also know that we are all subject to adulterated foods and various substitutions within our food patterns. We know that we are not able to be sure that poisonous materials are not present in at least small degrees in many food products as preservatives, and that gradually we may be undermining our health in the vain process of trying to keep alive. Though uh, probably the system will handle a certain amount of this abuse with fair ease. And if the nature is otherwise well integrated, uh, the person may have an occasional spell of uh, low vitality, but he'll snap out of it. If, however, the nature is at the same time naturally neurotic, and its energy resources are depressed, it is more and more easy to fall into holes in the dark. And these holes in the dark nearly always develop some kind of psychosomatic symbols. These holes in the dark never simply speak to us with some ghostly voice and say, you're short on calcium. We never get this kind of a situation. What we have is the same hollow voice warning us that some neighbor of ours is working witchcraft on us. Uh, our minds never seem to run to the subjective statement of reasonable things. They always get a little strange when they don't feel good. And this danger is so common in symptomology uh, that any physician knows all about it and has encountered it countless times. In cases where proper remedies cleared it up and there could be no correction for no, no doubt as to the correctness of his diagnosis. So we have this type of thing to, think, to consider. We have the problem of exercise, the proper maintenance of the body. We have the problem of carbon monoxide, of uh, various uh, sterilizers in the water system of a city. Uh, we have every type of thing you can think of fighting with our health and our survival, not necessarily killing us, that would be rather too simple, rather letting us suffer for a long time in a state of being about two-thirds alive and one-third dead. Now, the one-third that is dead, however, will never lie down. That one-third will haunt the other two-thirds as long as we live. And then when we get a little further along in this problem, I've noticed a number of other problems that have come along that are interesting. Just as surely as we have physical allergies, we have psychic allergies. Some individuals cannot uh, wear wool without breaking out as though they had strawberry rash. Another individual uh, cannot uh, stand a certain type of house paint. He breaks out with a rash that looks as though he had been rolling around in a bed of poison ivy. All kinds of allergies arise in the personal life. Though we also have psychic allergies. 
We all of us have certain things which psychically or psychologically we particularly resent. When we get too close to these things or they move in upon us, we promptly get sick. We rebel against them. And just as certain types of poison can cause convulsion, so we can have a very definite psychic convulsion if we are exposed long enough to certain psychic pressures. Which pressures they are in each individual, we can only learn as we learn what allergies may be from a great deal of testing. But it is perfectly possible for an individual, otherwise quite happy and contented, to have powerful psychic antipathies to people, uh, powerful psychic affinities to undesirable circumstances or characteristics, or to be in a position or condition to be made sick by the repetition of an event. All this type of thing uh, may have its bearing on the uh, psychic integration of the person. We could go on to a great many other different problems. Does any, uh, for instance, defect in hearing or defect in vision or the injury to any of the sensory perceptions or a basic permanent injury to some part of the nervous system or an old chronic accident. These can all give trouble. Then there's another thing that can give so much trouble that we almost think that it represents one of the primary curses of the human race, and that is poor elimination. Poor elimination is responsible for more pseudo-yogi experiences than any single cause. <laughs> the individual becomes so toxic that he is not sure whether he's heading for perdition or nirvana. He can have everything that would normally be associated with narcotic or alcoholic intoxication. And neither the narcotic addict nor the alcoholic very often sees anything nice. He always sees hurtful, dangerous, evil things, slimy things, things that seem to arise from some strange a lower world, not things that are beautiful and fine and noble, simply because the psychic integration will not permit him to live on a level uh, of alcoholism and at the same time of the capacity to experience subjectively beautiful experiences. It's just not possible within the gamut of the human framework that such things should occur. Then uh, we do have the lurking possibility, always, of course, of genuine mental disease. We have the possibility that the individual is sick, sicker than he realizes. But, that, uh, but this, in most cases, is not essentially true. I have seen a great many cases in which the patient would certainly have been regarded as an advanced mental case by any normal mental specialist who did get himself out of his condition well and did pull out and make an excellent recovery without medical help at all, simply because it is almost impossible today to detect the difference between a pseudo-ailment and a genuine expression of the same situation. So in most cases, I would feel that the danger of a serious mental situation does not develop unless the situation now existing has been allowed to endure for a great many years without any effort to correct it without any willingness to impose self-discipline upon emotions or upon mental attitudes. The individual who simply takes the bit in his teeth and determines to do exactly as he pleases regardless of everything is always a potential psychotic. But where intentions have been good, where the ailments are comparatively mild, and where the difficulty, though real, 
uh, is regarded with a certain amount of common sense and sincere desire to improve or correct, we do not have too much serious mental difficulty. It is, it is most often a situation of excessive bewilderment, a condition in which the person is unable to orient his own attitude. Another point that we do find now is that coming a little more into prevalence, and we have to watch it, is malnutrition due to excessive dieting and diet fads. Now, while there is much to point out the importance of certain reasonable diets, unreasonable dieting likely to reduce uh, the vitality of the individual or making promises of providing adequate vitality, which promises are not kept when the individual takes the dosage recommended, or the person who becomes fad ridden on the subject is very likely to lower his vitality. And if he does lower his vitality, we have to realize that malnutrition is one of the basic factors in the stimulation of psychic symptoms. The, uh, the, uh, the individual who is most likely to get into psychic difficulties is not essentially very healthy to start with, physically. Uh, sometimes they are overweight. This is quite common of psychics. Uh, overweight due to lymphatic and glandular imbalance. Uh, sometimes they have uh, de uh, debility due to failure to take in the food materials, which are the first line of defense against psychic pressure. And these are the foods that uh, the dieter is most inclined to avoid, carbohydrates and proteins. We are now, of course, inclined to favor high-protein diets. But the carbohydrates are the ones that keep the individual uh, with his feet very much physically on the ground. Now, he cannot always take them in excess, but where he cuts them too low, where he takes them entirely out of his diet, or tries to get along with almost none of them, he is almost certain to create greater activity of the pituitary and when he does this, he is more inclined to have visions or hallucinational experiences. <clears throat> so that uh, when we get someone who's in trouble, we try to check some of these things to find out whether the difficulty arises from some basic mistake that the person is making. If we find that this physical situation does exist, then it is obviously the first area in which correction should be made. The individual, incidentally, who will not correct these simple physical situations, if they are found to be present, is a very poor candidate for any psychological correction. If he will not do the common, simple things that other people in all areas of life have learned to do, it is very difficult to convince him to do any extraordinary things. And uh, here is where, of course, the old magicians uh, wage their strange magic warfare of their own. And it's a complicated and curious world, and it leads to all kinds of deceits and difficulties but our ancestors long ago began to be rather shrewd about these things. They said to themselves, let's assume for a moment that this individual is frightening himself to death. We can send him to the priest or the philosopher who will counsel him. We can send him to the doctor who will warn him. But this individual has reached a state of fear hysteria in which he simply won't listen. If you tell him that his trouble is simply due to his own loss of self-control, he will go to some other uh, uh, 
person to consult someone who has greater spiritual insight, because he knows perfectly well that he is innocent of all evil and has just been picked out to become a universal martyr. So if we don't appreciate this, he hunts for someone who does. And he'll always find them in the course of time. But his condition will remain the same or get worse. But this he doesn't realize. Well, back in the days when these problems uh, were perhaps more prevalent than they are now, uh, our ancestors developed probably quite subconsciously a strategy to handle them. The individual who was the victim of his own fear evidently was quite an impressionable soul. He was easily impressed by something, even if it was only fear. Therefore, you could use his own impressionability to create a new attitude. So the remedy consisted of giving him another magical factor which would give him self-confidence. You uh, sort of used uh, one remedy against another. If you found the person was suffering as the result of frightening himself out of his wits, you then gave him a sort of, a sort of courage potion that would make him believe that he was master of all he surveyed. Now, this, cur this courage potion could be most anything. It could be an amulet that he wore on his hand or around his neck which made him very certain that while he wore this amulet that had been blessed and had uh, been properly consecrated for the purpose, that none of these fools could get near him. And, of course, if he uh, was devout and the amulet had sufficient authority back of it, he probably didn't have any more trouble. He had changed his own basic thinking. The same problem uh, very largely applies when we're trying to get people today out of moral difficulties. If we can cause these people to believe that there is a moral force in nature which can help them, which is stronger than their own moral weakness, if through prayer or meditation or concentration or through some simple religious exercise, these people come to believe that they have available to them some source of good that is greater than themselves. Uh, they then develop a kind of new courage, a courage that may be stronger than the fear that hurt them before. This gives them a new look at life, a new point of view. They suddenly say to themselves, I can control this situation. I can master it. I am bigger than the situation. And if they will repeat that inwardly in themselves and come to really believe it, they can break down the counter-suggestion that is causing the trouble. So we have here a battle of suggestions. We have a, an effort to substitute a constructive attitude for a destructive one. And uh, that is the way that most ancient peoples fought out this particular difficulty. And they found that the, the most useful agencies in accomplishing these ends were religion, which gave the individual a faith in God, philosophy, which gave an individual a faith in truth or a faith in right, and in some attitudes, in some areas, science, which gave him a faith in skill or the ability of the physician to bring about the cure. Uh, even today, many rural doctors have found there is no medication equal to a bread pill. Today, however, they don't use bread so much. Cornstarch is the favorite in capsules. And if the capsule is large and hard to swallow, it is much more efficacious. But these people realize that, many doctors realize that the patient is frightened. Frightened not because they are really sick, but because of some strange symptom. Perhaps they have bought the old almanac and have found that 
they have all the ailments that are threatened in the almanac. So the doctor gives them the universal cure-all and they feel better very, very rapidly. Of course, we also had in the old days a number of most efficacious tonics that were used by the farming people very extensively. Uh, we don't know too much about the more subtle ingredients of the tonic, but there's no doubt that the 18% alcohol was beneficial. The individual certainly was cheered by this uh, addition to his diet, and it was possible for respectable teetotalers to use it because it was a medicine. So whatever changes these attitudes often breaks up problems. But unfortunately, we can't always depend even upon this type of situation for help. We have the person who really or psychologically, however we want to view it, is in trouble. He is in trouble to the point that it seems as though uh, there is no easy way out for him. He has gotten himself mixed up in a situation of which uh, neither he nor anyone else uh, can actually wave a magic wand and bring about his recovery. Many of these people who get into difficulties as a result of organizations that they have belonged to write to the leaders of these organizations and ask for help. Usually the leaders cannot give them any because the leader himself doesn't know what to do with this kind of problem. The member believes that the organization is to blame. Actually, the organization carries only secondary responsibility. There has to be something in the person who is in trouble that made it almost inevitable that he would be in trouble. And if he had not joined that organization, he would have joined another one. And if he had joined no organization, he would have still had a nervous breakdown from the pressures of his own personality. So the, the individual who is really in serious trouble, but still sufficiently integrated to realize that he is in serious trouble, has to face a rather long and thorough process of rehabilitation. He has to recover just exactly as a narcotics addict has to recover. He has to do it the slow, hard way. And he should have a certain amount of directive. But if he is not willing to follow directive, there is no power in the world that can force him to do so. So presuming that we have one of two situations, which as far as their treatment is concerned, uh, is the same for both. The both we want to say now that the individual is suffering from some form of a possessing or obsessing entity. And that in this case we wish to affirm that this entity is a psychic entity, and therefore that the individual is actually what he thinks he is or what his symptoms might cause others to believe that he is, namely possessed by a being apart from himself. Let's assume that this is one possibility. Or let us assume as a second parallel possibility that this so-called possession or obsession is a pressure area of his own nature which has taken over the dominion of his life, and refuses to relinquish its leadership so that the direct, integrated consciousness itself can resume its proper relationship to the rest of the personality. In other words, that the obsession or possession is either psychic or psychological. Now, in either instance, and the problem is essentially the same in both cases, Whatever is done must be done to reorganize the power of the entity itself. If the, uh, that is in this case, the, the person's own entity. The consciousness of the individual 
must be restored to leadership. It must be restored to leadership because it is able either to displace some other entity or displace some other area of pressure that has usurped authority. In the, in the final analysis, it really makes very little difference. What cures one will cure the other. What is not sufficient for one is not sufficient for the other. We all realize that no matter how we want to view this, the most destructive emotion in the universe is fear. Fear is the greatest killer that we know. Fear can stop your heart as quick as a bullet. Fear can stop any function of the body, the emotions, or the mind. And an extraordinary paroxysm of fear or of terror can accomplish almost as much damage within the body of a human being as the release of a hydrogen bomb. Fear, as the ancients all pointed out, is that emotion which creates a relation of negation by means of which the individual is open to everything that is bad, everything that is weak, everything that is wrong. There is nothing that can create a criminal more rapidly than fear, even though he may be full of bravado about it. There is nothing that can cause us to compromise our ethics any more rapidly than fear. There is nothing that can destroy our integration, our orientation in life, more rapidly than fear. And according to uh, most psychics who have explored the invisible constitution of man, Fear destroys all the natural defense mechanisms of the magnetic field against the possibilities of obsession, the, uh, the possibilities of infection by bacterial organisms, or the possibilities of contagion. And these fear motives also destroy the uh, power of the body to take in energy by closing, compressing uh, the various uh, channels through which vitality can reach the body. Therefore, fear completely enervates in time. It leads to all kinds of desperate actions and usually causes the individual to multiply his karma many-fold very quickly. If, therefore, a person is fearful, he becomes wide open to every negative factor of life, the universe around him, and the pressures of his own personality within him. He lowers his defenses and his resistances. And when anything becomes the object of fear, the individual who is frightened is defeated, then and there. Consequently, fear will help uh, to intensify any type of psychotic situation. As surely as fear is the great destroyer, as we have mentioned, faith is the universal medicine. So fear is the poison, and faith is the remedy for nearly every situation that can arise. If the individual wishes to assume that he is the victim of an obsessing being of some kind, the only possible way of outwitting this situation is to remove the importance of it as a psychic factor in the integration of the person. If he will not be afraid, 
if he simply declines to fear, no negative factor can get very close to him. And any factor negative that is close to him can no longer achieve any particular effect. And we may assume that uh, nothing in nature will remain indefinitely engaged in a profitless undertaking. The moment the individual ceases to be afraid, he mends the tears in his own magnetic field. Fear opens the solar plexus, and whatever mysterious negative forces we believe to exist outside of us, uh, the solar plexus becomes the mirror of death. These forces move in through uh, the opening of the negative areas of life. Everything that is evil is essentially negative. Everything that is destructive is negative because ne negativity is destruction. Everything that tears down is negative. And everything that supports negation increases and enlarges it. A person who is negative is in trouble. But if to this negation is added jealousy, we have a double negative, And the individual is in more trouble. If his natural negation plus the jealousy increases worry, he has three negative factors. If later, in addition to worry, comes criticism or uh, some form of hate, we have more negative factors. So everything that is wrong builds up negatives. And when the individual has enough negatives, he falls apart. When he has enough negative situations, the individual himself ceases. The individual who is nothing but a mass of worries, fears, anxieties, neuroses, uh, selfish pre pre uh, pressures, self-interest, self-centeredness, all of these negative things, when there is nothing but this type of thing functioning in the individual's life, or at least these hopelessly overbalance every other consideration, the individual simply ceases to be an individual. After John Doe has enough of this negation built up in him, he simply isn't John Doe any longer. He is simply a hole in a psychological darkness. And you can call him John Doe if you want to, but his real name is Negation. And the uh, real name of the devil in ancient times was also negation. So this negative situation means that the person has voluntarily relinquished the leadership on his own life. He has turned it over to his anxieties, to his doubts, uh, to his timidities, his uncertainties, and to a large degree uh, his natural orneriness. He has found, or to his own satisfaction, that he'd much rather be angry than be healthy. Only he doesn't make the comparison. But as by degrees he relinquishes his integrity center, he simply ceases. Now there is an old saying that some of the ancient scientists is credited with to the effect that nature abhors a vacuum. When the individual has made a first-class vacuum out of himself so that he's nothing but a mysterious whirl of darkness surrounded by trouble, this individual may then be said to be in a condition suitable to be obsessed by anything, anything that comes along is stronger than he is. He could be obsessed by... Uh, the uh, ego or the libido of an insect. <laughs> because at least an insect in its short life has some purpose. It is fulfilling its destiny. But this person is no longer fulfilling any destiny. 
simply a derelict, a, a, a drifting ship waiting to be salvaged by something. No, it doesn't, this isn't the way the person feels about it, but these are the gloomy facts that the third person has to take into consideration. If we assume that the negative person is apt to be obsessed by some other entity, it is easy to understand why such an individual would be obsessed. And it is also very easy to understand that anything that would obsess such a person has to be put in no count itself. Because no entity of great value, power, and insight is going to obsess an integration that is so negative and so worthless that nothing good can be expected from it. And what happens? Wherever an obsession situation does appear, the individual simply becomes worse. He gradually gets pulled further and further into hopelessness, helplessness, and fear. The obsession never makes a man out of a fool. But it can apparently sometimes make a fool out of an individual who internally is already well along the way of foolishness. Now, if you want to, on the other hand, assume that it isn't an entity, but that it is a part of the individual's own consciousness that is moving in, then we know that the part is always less than the whole, that the partial consciousness never has the morality, the ethics, the convictions, the idealism, uh, the aspirations, which can only result from the consciousness itself and solely its own emotional and mental vehicles. So if one of these lesser vehicles takes over, the individual's morality immediately lowers. And another symptom is that when the consciousness loses control and these lower parts take over, there is a physical demoralization. The body becomes also uh, disintegrated in some respect or other. The individual uh, develops very rapidly extraordinary glandular symptoms. The individual becomes less coordinated, the body becomes sloppy, hopeless, no longer effective, because the consciousness is not leading it, and that part of the entity which is leading it isn't strong enough. So when we get a poor government, and we force the proper ruler out of office, we naturally expect the empire to decay, and it does. The whole personality falls apart. And some one of these several different personalities which can exist, sometimes more than one fighting for dominion will create a multiple personality problem. But in all these multiple personalities, there will very seldom be found anything uh, that is truly noble, truly really fine. Uh, there may be different levels of inadequacy, some vicious, uh, some merely helpless. But we will never find that the individual ruled by a fragment of himself has the same wisdom and insight that he has when he is ruled by all of himself. So what do we have? We have two problems. Either the individual is ruled by something else which can never rule him properly, because it wasn't created uh, for that purpose, or he is ruled by part of himself, which cannot rule properly, because it does not possess the total insight necessary for leadership. Wherever this kind of condition occurs, there is only one possible answer. The controlling power must be restored. That which is the self in the individual must be again seated on the uh, seat of authority. And this cannot generally be accomplished without some real, sincere, continuing, personal effort. The individual who is weak cannot become strong unless he exercises his powers and faculties and builds strength. 
He cannot have the wisdom to restore himself unless he becomes basically wiser than the situation in which he uh, is involved. Therefore, to this type of person, only philosophic insight, sincerely and earnestly sought, and wisely applied, and everything else that is needed to cultivate, culture, and normalize the life of the person must be cultivated. The individual must be lifted out of every negative pattern and brought back into self-respect, self-discipline, and reasonable coordination. Unless these things are done, there cannot be an adequate remedy. Usually the adequate remedy is not found. The individual simply drifts along until the causes themselves or other causes remove him from life. But it is possible at any time to overcome these situations if we really determine to do so. It is this degree of determination which must be the best and only really practical therapy. We cannot expect others to solve these problems. We cause them over a long period of time. Sometimes they're comic. We must solve them by becoming greater than the problem. And nearly all great systems of enlightenment, of religion and philosophy, and of the higher aesthetic arts and sciences were created to assist the individual in two ways. First, assist him to maintain proper self-leadership. And second, to help him to restore proper self-leadership if it is lost. And only through the cultivation of these abilities and aptitudes can we put this fragmented personality back together again under the leadership which was intended in nature. And it is only when this is done that our problem is solved. Well, our time is up, so we'll have to go into this a little more next week when we will continue some of this basic thinking. Thank you very much.